after luncheon break. We're going to pray and go straight into our study. Jesus, the Lord of rest, for our human restlessness. We invite those on the outside to join us. Our text before we pray is found in Isaiah 57, Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57. And Isaiah 48, 22. Two texts we will read before we pray. Isaiah 57, 20 and 21. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose water cast up mire and, and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Isaiah 57, 20 and 21. And Isaiah 48, 22, the same thing. There is no peace, saith Jehovah, unto the wicked. Uh, the report from Trinidad uh, will be given next Sabbath afternoon. Uh, so, sorry for that delay. Let us pray. Well, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of worship and uh, studying your word. Bring us together in your name and by your spirit to understand your truth. We thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath. We thank you for Jesus, who is Lord of the Sabbath, Lord of rest. In his name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. The world is in a state of unrest. And of course that unrest started as a tiny seed of unrest at the fall accelerated to terrible chaos before the flood, caused the flood. And after the flood, that unrest continued with human restlessness, the Tower of Babel, scattering of nations, unrest in language, so there are different tongues. And the Bible shows that human unrest accelerates before a crisis, causing the crisis. And in these last days, the unrest will reach its ultimate peak, zenith. The cause of this unrest is rejection of the divine government. And for us in this Christian era, the cause of unrest is rejection of God's salvation the good news of that salvation and all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Now God chose the people of Israel to be the recipients of his grace, his salvation, and his rest. But the children of Israel, chosen by God to be in the kingdom of grace, also had unrest. They were murmuring and fretting and complaining. And amazingly, the people who belonged to God had no more rest than the people who did not belong to God. Casting reproach on the name of God. With the heathen saying, well, they are no better than us. And so we today in the end time, we are in a world of terrible unrest. And as we know, sin separates 
every system, every power, everything it touches from God's righteousness, causing that thing, that power, that system to be perverted and to be bent towards chaos, disorder, unrest, and destruction. And the world's unrest will reach a peak. And Satan will use that unrest which he, Satan, causes. I think we should be clear that God does not cause any unrest, any calamity, any destruction, any chaos. It is all the result of sin separating from God. Sin separating from God's righteousness. All of the unrest in the world is a result of bad, demonic, and human choices. So Satan, the cause of unrest, will then use that unrest to present a package to human beings which will have a symbol of pseudo-rest. It is interesting that God's final warning will present the true gospel, the character of God, will present the sign of true rest, the seventh day creation Sabbath. Whereas Satan's package which the Bible calls the mark of the beast package, will present a sign of pseudo-rest. We are told in Revelation 14 that those who receive the mark of the beast will have no rest day or night. So worshiping the beast and the image of the beast and receiving the mark of the beast will carry the world to its peak of unrest. But before it reaches that peak, Satan's suggestion to the world will be that his package of church state union and enforcing Sunday sacredness will heal the world, will bring rest and order, and millions will be deceived. As we are told, the generation that will be most deceived will be the generation that will be the most educated according to the world standards. So education is no guarantee that people will not be deceived. The brightest nations in Europe have voted folly only to look back and, wondered what, and, to, and wonder what they have done. Germany, the pride of European education, still look back and wonder how they could have voted in Hitler in 1933. So education is no guarantee that people will not be deceived and easily saw by sweet talk. I have a few quotations to share as we get going. We saw last week that the only remedy for unrest is receiving the mind of Christ, which is God's unselfish, self-sacrificing, agape love. Where God's love is and where it reigns, there can be no unrest. Wherever there is unrest, God's love is either not there or if it is there, it is not being allowed to control. So there's unrest in the world. We expect that. But when we see unrest among the people of God, who have the truth of God, it means that they're not surrendering to the love of God. It is not only those who have the spirit of God that are God's, but as the great reformer says, it is those who are led by the Spirit. We are to have the Spirit and to be led by the Spirit. And that means being in Christ and accepting the good news of all that God has done for us. 
We had a quotation last week. These are Avengers 330. I'm going to read it again. It is the love of self that brings unrest. So whether it is war in the world, a family quarrel, a church quarrel, a work quarrel, whatever it is, it is the love of self that brings unrest. When we are born from above, the same mind will be in us that was in Jesus, the mind that led him to humble himself that we might be saved. So the, our opening text tells us that God says there is no rest, no peace to the wicked. The wicked are like the troubled sea casting up mar and sand when a hurricane passes. Of course, the thing about the sea is that the sea looks very calm, when no hurricane is passing. So I may look very calm when no hurricane is passing. If a hurricane passes and I get like the sea that is tumbling and rough, during that hurricane, I am not letting the love of God, if I have it, lead me, or I may not have it at all. So Jesus, uh, in Matthew 11, Matthew chapter 11, tells us something. Matthew 11, Matthew 11, familiar passage, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, verse 29, verse 30. We can start at verse 27. Matthew chapter 11 from verse 27 to the end of the chapter. Matthew 11, 27. The good news first of all. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. So the Father has given his Son all things and given his Son all things for us. Elsewhere it says that God gathered together all the treasures of heaven, these are verses 57, put them in the hands of his son and told his son, these are for a man. Convince him that there is no love greater than my love for him. So Jesus goes on. No man knoweth the son, but the father. Neither knoweth any man the father, save the son, and he to whomsoever the son will reveal him. This is a very powerful text. People who try to understand God without going to Jesus Christ are blaspheming. Strong word. Deliberately chosen. Because if nobody knows the Father but the Son, and him to whomsoever the Son will reveal, to bypass that formula and to try to know God without knowing God through the Son is blasphemy. Having stated that, Jesus then says in verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, verse 29, and learn of me. Learn of me. So learning of Jesus, learning of Jesus is critical in this matter of experiencing the rest that God has given. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And what do we learn when we learn of Jesus? For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we learn that Jesus is meek and lowly at heart, that is self-sacrificing and selfish love. And that takes us back to what we read last week, Philippians chapter 2. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. In everything, esteem others better than yourselves. Let the same attitude, the same thinking process, the same mindset be in you as was in Jesus. While Lucifer wanted to go up to snatch the throne of God, 
Jesus gave up everything and came right down into the eternal separation that sin causes from his father to suffer it for us, to save us from disaster. That's the mind of Christ. And that is the only mind that can cure unrest, as we heard this morning in the devotion. Before I go for, for a few quotations, I have an interesting story. It's a real story from a piece of history. And when I read it, I asked myself this question. Is the church of God to be better than or worse than the world? Listen to this short story. The end of a food. F-E-U-D is pronounced food? Feud? Uh, pardon me. The end of a feud. The end of a quarrel. Listen to this. American history tells us that the most famous feud or quarrel in American history started over a pig. In 1878, Randolph McCoy reportedly accused Floyd Hatfield of stealing his pig. The Hatfields and the McCoys most certainly had had blood blood between them before the alleged theft. Both families competed against each other in the timber business and differences during the Civil War lingered after the war had been decided. So notice this. They had these differences. These differences there were unconscious. Then all of a sudden, there was a stealing of a pig. A few years after the pig incident, Randolph's sons, that's Randolph McCoy's sons, listen carefully, Randolph McCoy's sons killed Ellison Hatfield after Ellison shouted an insult to one of the men. So from stealing the pig now, there's murder. Hatfield, who was called Devil Ants, exacted justice on the McCoys by killing all three of the men that killed his son. The violence grew as the McCoys raided the Hatfield territory to get revenge. And before long, now this is, this is white civilized America. I asked myself if any of these men were slaves, what would have happened? Before long, portions of Kentucky and West Virginia joined in the fighting, forcing the governors of both states to call in the National Army to restore peace. The battling lasted a decade, and at least a dozen people of both families were killed. A hundred years later, it is a different story. The Hatfields and the McCoys still battle, but not like before. They battle in a softball game and tug of war. The difference came because a great-great-grandson helped to organize a reunion. He said, this Bad blood has gone on long enough. Let's stop it. Today in America, this event, the Hatfield McCoy event of playing the game, draws many thousands of tourists when they hear the story. A famous feud resolved. Hated neighbors accepted as friends. The Hatfields and McCoys are a modern-day reminder that no relationship is beyond saving. No matter how different or offensive a person is, you can show love and acceptance to that person. This is the friendship Bible giving this story. And then it goes on to say, Colossians 1, 21 to 23 says, that we were once enemies of God, but that didn't stop God from loving us and accepting us. God loved us while we were still sinners. God didn't try to get revenge on us like those families, or for hurting him, 
nor did God wait until we got our act together before he began reaching out to us in Jesus Christ in acceptance and love. Make God's love your inspiration as you interact with your church members, your neighbors, your fellow workers, your schoolmates, and even your enemies. What a story. What a story. Few quotations here as we get going. Won't be too long. Review and Herald. Review and Herald. April 30, 1889. We should glorify God. Listen carefully to these couple of quotations. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now comes the statement. It is aspiring to be superior to others that brings us on rest of soul. See this uh, dimension of uh, self-centeredness? Aspiring to be superior to others that brings us on rest of soul. Politics, the whole world, people trying to make themselves superior to others, prove themselves better than others, goes on. In wearing Christ's yoke, there is peace and rest and happiness. While wearing his yoke, we will not keep silent. We desire that those who are weary and heavy laden shall come and find rest unto their souls. Those who do come to Christ find his joy and his peace is expressed in their very countenances. Christ denied himself for our sake. His divine feet pressed through every difficulty that Satan could place in his way. He trod the path to Calvary and was crucified on the cross that you and I might have rest and peace and eternal life. That is why the gospel and the character of God are so intricately tied up with rest. And that is why people, when people ask the question, why is it that we are talking about the gospel and the character, and the final issues will be over Saturday and Sunday. The Sabbath rest represents the results of the very foundation of God's government. The Sunday false rest also represents the very foundations of the satanic government. And so during the final crisis, two flags will be flown. The seventh-day Sabbath, the flag of the true gospel, God's character and government, and the pseudo-rest, the flag of Satan's government. Every government likes to fly a flag. Even the people in the east there who are killing, they have a flag, and they put it up wherever their presence is. Two flags will be flown very high in the final crisis. Under the seventh-day Sabbath rest, undergirded by self-sacrificing love, will be that love revealed in the gospel and the character of God. The world will hear the good news. God has already taken care of all your unrest. As bad as you are, Jesus died on Calvary's cross for you. God has legally pardoned you. The penalty to use the legal term, for your sins has been exhausted. All of your sins have been put on Jesus, and he paid the infinite price for them. That price cannot be paid again because it was paid by Christ. It was paid fully, and it was paid infinitely, which means that condemnation has been taken care of. And God invites you to come as you are. You don't have to do anything before you come. As the Holy Spirit draws you and you see the love of God, you will become sorry for sin by that love. Repentance is a gift. 
As the Holy Spirit draws you and you sees that love, it will be getting you trust. You will be so amazed at what God has done for you that you will trust him. So as you come, all that you need to do, God gives you to enable you to do it. You can't do it before you come. While the Holy Spirit draws you, he gives you repentance. He gives you confession. He gives you faith. What a God. What a God. This is the good news that will lighten the earth with the glory of God. As old Dr. Graham Maxwell used to say, even in preaching the seven last plagues, we will be telling people that wrath is not a liquid poured out. Wrath is what the Apostle Paul explains. God, the God of freedom, will step back and hand those who don't want him with tears in his eyes over to the gods of their choice. And each step backward will see a further collapse of nature. So the loud cry will present the character of God, Bible prophecy and everything else so clearly that every man's mind will be made up. Those who reject that love fix their minds in rejecting God. Those who accept it fix their minds in accepting Jesus Christ. But one point, before we read another quotation, before the true church of God can give that final warning of God's gospel, character, and Sabbath rest, the true church of God itself must be brought to experience that rest and peace in a unity that itself will shock the world. So unrest in the church must be healed before we give the final warning to tell a world God wants to heal your unrest. How can we tell the world which is restless about their unrest and God's rest for them if we, the church of God, cannot experience that rest? Now, Satan is very clever. A lot of people are worrying about this recent U.S. election. And as I tell people... Uh, the final events are not going to be triggered by any particular president. Adventists should know that the final events are going to be triggered by God's people ripening to at least the stage of the air to receive the latter rain, to give the final warning. Satan will use many things to try to destabilize, first of all, the USA. And as he, if and as he sees God's people ripening, he will intensify his efforts to destabilize, to get his package. But it all depends upon God's people. When the 1888 message came, back in 1888, Satan saw that God's people could be getting ready, and he moved straight to Senator Blair to get a Sunday law passed. So, had, God people, had, had God's people accepted the 1888 message, a final crisis was around the corner. God's people rejected the 1888 message, the Sunday law was put to one side. Doesn't depend on the president, depends on the ripening of God's people. Old Cecil uh, forgot, forgot, forgot his uh, old Cecil Matthews who lived to the ripe old age of 90 used to tell me Brother Doug Lane, when World War II started when World War II started Adventists said this is it this is the Armageddon this is the final crisis but World War II finished he said I've come to understand that these things are not to do with the end specifically it is the ripening of God's people in his character so Satan will create many diversions. Of course, we are to follow the events, but we are never to misunderstand that our ripening is the ultimate trigger. The world is becoming more and more unrestful, to coin a word, and God's people must be ahead of that. We must be experiencing as a church, as individuals, as families in the house of God, rest. Now, your, our experiencing rest doesn't mean that everybody will experience rest. People all around Jesus were devoid of the rest of God. 
And yet we are told that so emptied of self was Christ that he made no plans for himself. Though all around him were storms of satanic attack, Jesus was at perfect rest with his father and with what work he had to do. Another quotation here. This is Signs of the Times. Signs of the Times, uh, October 9, 1901, The Coming Crisis. Signs of the Times, ST, October 19, 1901. A little bit on it. Troublous times are right upon us. You heard that? Troublous times are right upon us. The signs of the times give evidence that the judgments of heaven are being poured out, that the day of the Lord is at hand. What is meant by the judgments of God being poured out? The explanation comes. The restraining spirit of God, paragraph 2, is even now being withdrawn from the world. So four angels, four mighty angels, with angels unto them, are holding the various systems and powers of nature in check. Don't forget, all the powers of nature inside you, inside me, around us, the wind, the air, the sea, all of them have been spoiled by sin. And God holds them from collapsing completely by his grace because of the sacrifice of Christ. That sound that has quickly become a favorite of mine and this, this week, uh, I signed both the tune that I, that I love that the, uh, I have to be careful how I call this choir, the choir that Brother Merton is in, that choir sings. I call it the senior choir last week, I was rebuked because somebody told me older than anybody in it except Sister Graves, Sister Phillips. So the choir that Brother uh, Merton is in, you know that sound? Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off your guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. My surety stands before the throne. This is the sweet part. My name is written on his hands. Praise the Lord. And what we said last week, Jesus ceases not to present those who trust him complete in himself before the Father. That specific grace. He is pleading for everybody before his Father. That's general grace. That's why the world continues. And while we keep our eyes on him, the Holy Spirit ceases not his work of conforming us to his image. What a, what a wonderful God. So the angels are holding, him, holding back the winds of strife. The atmosphere, we, these things are beyond science and beyond us, you know. The wind, the atmosphere, and everything, everything has been spoiled by sin, and that spoilage continues, but is held in check from accelerating downward by God's mercy because of the sacrifice of Christ. As mankind rejects Christ, the angels, by virtue of the law of freedom, have to loosen their restraint. Have to. Because God does not violate the law of freedom. If there is one law that God cannot violate, it's the law of freedom. If you don't want God, he will plead with you. But if your mind is made up that you don't want him, he appoints a day when he will give you up to your choice. He has to. Because he's made you a free, a free creature. So as the world rejects Christ, and don't fool yourself, the world is in a mess. The vast majority of human beings don't believe in Jesus Christ. In the universities, the professors teach that there is no God. It is the educated thing now to say that there is no God. There is a big bind theory in evolution. Whole set of nonsense people believe. Their textbooks so thick on lies. So the world 
Uh, we usually say, holding on by the skin of your teeth, the angels are holding back the winds of strife by the skin of their teeth. If angels have teeth or skin, you know what I mean. It is slipping from their grasp. They're barely holding on. And therefore, calamities will increase as human beings push away the angelic protection. And then Satan, watch this, Satan will blame God for those calamities in a subtle way. He will tell people, God is punishing the world because you're all are not respecting Sunday. So Satan has this double bluff, double trick. So tremendous deception is up ahead. Tremendous more unrest will come. And God's people must be at rest in Jesus Christ. Must be at rest in Jesus Christ. Back to this quotation. Troublous times are right upon us. The signs of the time give evidence that the judgments of heaven are being poured out. I mean, no, you understand what that term means now? The judgments of heaven are being poured out. God is letting go the world bit by bit because the world does not want him. He's holding on until the servants of God, Revelation 7, are sealed in their foreheads. And that sealing means a full acceptance of the gospel, a full acceptance of the character, intellectually and experientially, abiding in Christ, keeping our eyes on Christ, so that the love of God in Christ through the Holy Spirit fills and controls us. When we reach the point of being willing to die for those who want to kill us, agape love is perfected. You heard that? When we reach the point of being willing to die for those who are about to kill us, Agape love has been perfected. I can look and see how far away I am from that end point. You can look and see how far away you are from that end point and see therefore how much time we have down here to get ready. Because as we heard this morning in the devotion, God never fights fire with fire. The Bible says, do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. God always overcomes evil with good. And the good we are talking about here is the absolute good. Agape, self-sacrificing, unselfish, all for the other, none for self, love. But Satan would have the world and the church believe that agape love is weak and can't really solve problems or overcome anything. So the world has its own way of dealing with problems, war and intrigue and lies. And Satan has infiltrated the church to use the world's methods as well. We are to use God's method, love. Agape love. And every now and then you hear people say some strange things about love. And they even bring quotations to say these strange things about love. But love is not weak. And when you, when you see certain statements being made about love, that is talking about what human beings call love. Not God's love. I was searching the other day and found a fantastic statement where it says, the only method God has of dealing with sin and winning sinners and saving them is his love, gentleness, compassion, and mercy. When the sinner rejects that, he piles up his own wrath. Wrath means separation from God by sin. And separated from God, there is nothing that can help anything or anybody. But God is not in the business of hurting. He only is in the business of agape love. So the quotation goes on, and this presentation finishes at 4.30. The restraining spirit of God is even now being withdrawn from the world. Hurricanes, storms, tempests, disasters by sea and land follow one another in quick succession. Why? The restraining spirit of God is even now being withdrawn from the world. And why is it being withdrawn? Human beings are pushing it away. They don't want God. The signs thickening around us, telling us of the near approach of the Son of God, are attributed to any other cause than the true. 
Men cannot discern the sentinel angel restraining the four winds that they should not blow until the servants of God are sealed. But when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there shall be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. The time is right upon us when there will be sorrow in the world that no human balm can heal. We, we think things are bad now. The time is right upon us when there will be sorrow in the world that no human balm can heal. Even before the last great destruction comes upon the world, the flattering monuments of man's greatness will be crumbled into dust. Retributive judgments, remember what those terms mean, retributive judgments, the law of sowing and weeping. Men sow self. As a matter of fact, uh, I, don't, I may not have time to quote that other quotation this evening, but it's one of it says that in this world, there are terribly deceptive methods being used to gain wealth and power and to trample on the foot those who are less fortunate. And these things have the world and its socio-economy in trouble. And the experts cannot understand because they do not believe the word of God and the principle of sowing and weeping. So when you have atheistic economists, they can never tell you why there's a recession. They don't believe in God. So the people of God, in truth and in fact, are to be the most learned people on earth, learned in the truth of God's word. Because the systems of the world's education, we are to pull gems of truth out of that at the secular level. But the philosophy behind that system is all self. And that's why we are told in the final crisis, men who never went to school will confound judges and lawyers and doctors. I was just in the vestry not long, but earlier on, and Brother Lascelles was showing someone a video that I had seen earlier, a big talking, boastful atheist asking what he thought was high sounding questions. And a Christian got up. And when the Christian was finished with him, I tell somebody, Christian licked the stiffening out of his uh, boastful philosophy, lick him to pieces. So when we study the Word of God, we'll have a knowledge and an understanding from God. That those who don't believe in God, though they have six PhDs, cannot gain say. It is our privilege to know the truth and to experience the truth as it is in Jesus. This piece now says, The Lord sends to his people the warning, Take heed to yourselves, lest that any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that they come upon you on the wares. For as a snare it will come on all them that dwell on the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of God. And when you pray to be accounted worthy, you know that the merits of Christ alone make you worthy. We are living in a time that calls for decided action. The world is more bitterly opposed than ever to the gospel reform. But notwithstanding this, God's work is to go forward. The words of Christ come down to us who are living at the close of this earth's history. When these things shall begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. The nations are in unrest. Times of perplexity are upon us. Men's hearts are filling them for fear of the things that are coming upon the earth. But those who believe in God will hear his voice amid the storm, saying, It is I, be not afraid. The world is lying in wickedness and apostasy. Rebellion to God's law seems almost universal. The tumult of excitement and confusion is in every place. There's a work to be done. The work of preaching and living the true gospel and the true message of God's love. Now next time, 
we are going to begin to look at the absolutely fundamental principles of agape love that underpin rest and see why the seventh day Sabbath has to be the flag of God's government. And we shall understand when we look at those deep principles to as much as we can fathom why God's love and God's love alone is the only principle that can, can succeed both in a sinless universe and a sinful universe, bring everything back together in Christ. Brother Ben, you have your hand up? Pardon? Uh, I, I, I'm not hearing you. Oh, you're, you're telling me that Brother Bobby wants to ask me a question. He's asking you, and he's not asking me. Pardon? Oh, I see. Okay, go to the mic, Brother Bobby. Uh, turn on the mic when you get to it, please. Seven, that is the fall upon the earth. Now it says that the four wings are holding in strife. The, the, the angels are holding the four wings of strife so that the people are God to receive their sealing. Now it says that the people of majority of the people of God are still in Babylon. So I'm asking the question, the plagues will fall upon the world or when it says the plagues for, uh, the angels are holding in check the four wings of strife, it's holding in check the, 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 the plagues from falling upon the professed people of God first. And, and then after that, it will fall upon the world, but the, 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 the events that we are now associating, the um, plagues, that we are associating the plagues as uh, regarding the coming of the Lord are not in Revelation 7. You know what I'm saying? Not quite. Let me go again. I'm saying that we are saying that the plagues, the angels are holding in check the winds of strife that they will not fall upon the earth. Follow me so far? Yes. But I'm saying according to Revelation the angels are holding back the four wings of strife, and this, the, the strife that they're holding back is the plagues that is a fall upon the church first, because Babylon represents the churches that has God's people now today still in them. So the plagues cannot fall upon God, the churches first until God's people are called out of all of those churches who would have do what, rejected the gospel. But we, you say that it's the, the angels are holding back the wings by the skin of their teeth from falling. And to me, though, that language is not suitable. Oh. To be honest with you, you, you've lost me. The seven last plagues uh -huh. don't fall on one set of people and then on another set of people. The seven last plagues begin after the close of probation and fall on those, to use the term, fall on those who have the mark of the beast. I'm asking the question regarding that. That we are saying so, but according to... Not we are saying so, the word of God says so. I hope you interpret it. No. But I'm saying it's... Or we are part of the majority of people of God is... L listen. The seven last plagues begin to fall after the closure of probation. And before the closure of probation, all of God's people, wherever they are, come together to be sealed in the final generation 
of living saints, the true remnant. Okay, when the statement says that God, the majority of God's people are still in Babylon, where is that? That's the fallen churches. Okay. And so, they will come out of those churches and be sealed before probation closes and, and before the angels let go. That the angels do not let go the four wings of strength that they will not fall upon the Babylon first. No, 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 you can't use that language. There's no first or second in the fallen of the seven last plagues. The seven last plagues fall on the world after probation closes because the world will be sold out to the mark of the beast and the people of God, all the people of God, those that were in Babylon and those that were not in inverted commas, will be sealed with the sealed living God. So I don't understand how you're confusing those two things. No, I'm confusing them. I'm, we, we often say that if, according to Revelation, it says that Babylon represents false Christianity. Now, events, disasters, and plagues are falling upon the world right now. But they are, they are, not, a, a, they are not as a result of the angels letting go the wings of strife. The, 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 the cause of the wings letting go the wings of strife will be when the people of God who are still in the church, who are still in the professed world right now at the moment, and when they, are when they receive the seal, then the angels are bidden to let go because the, the church, the professed church, would have now incurred, would have incurred the wrath of God by reason of rejecting the true Sabbath. Now, the, 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 the one with the hand now, it says that the professed people, the professed people will receive the mark of this in their hand, in their foreheads, but the world of itself will receive it in their hand, according to the Re revelation suggests that. Could you explain that? Well, you uh, you jumping all over the place. I'm making some statements that are not correct, so let me get back. You are saying, let me make it clear, that the angels let go completely after the closure of probation. But all, all like now, they're loosening, that's what she meant. The restraining spirit of God, even now, is being withdrawn. The withdrawal will not be complete until probation is closed. So your statement that the things that are happening now are not because the angels are letting go, should be corrected to be saying, the things that are happening now are the result of the angels loosening as they are being pushed back. When they completely let go at the closure of probation, then the disaster of the seven last place will occur. That's the correct way to put that. I don't agree. Well, give me your reasons for not agreeing. Um, okay, I um, disagree. Now, on, you talk about Satan government. On this Satan government, there's unrest and there's confusion. And that's going on today. And that's going on. That have nothing to do on the God's government, right? I don't know what I mean by that statement. On the Satan's government, you will get unrest and all kinds of things. And what's the mechanism of that unrest? Because they would have rejected God's real government and accept Satan's government. And what's the, me what's the and mechan Satan what's the mechanism? Satan's government itself still has a function in this world. And, and the government of this um, of the world is functioning under Satan's government or under his belief, under his um, propaganda. So you see, the events that are happening are a result of using Satan's government to, to, to framework their um, function. Now, I'm saying that. When the four wings, the angels are holding the four wings of strife, the strife is over the professed people of God, where God's people are still, um, where God's people rem um, still remain in those fallen, in fallen Christianity. Where you get that from? Revelation suggests that. Re read it, let me hear. It says that the, the angels are holding in strife until the people of God are sealed. And also that the uh, majority of people, God's people pause. are still in Babylon. Pause. The angels holding the four winds of strife unto the people of God are sealed. Is saying what you just said just now? Yeah. Yeah? Mm. 
All right, finish your uh, dissertation, sir. What part of the majority of people of God is? But you, you are mixing up a number of things here and jumping about and not following the line. The majority of God's people are in Babylon, yes. Therefore, hold, so the angels are holding in strife. The angels are holding back the forces of evil until God's people are sealed. Wherever those people are. And then the angels will completely let go when the seven last plagues will occur. So the ceiling, what part of the ceiling work going to begin? The ceiling work going to begin with God's people are still, uh, with, with God's people still in the fallen churches. The ceiling work going to begin with God's people while they are still in the fallen churches because the, the the, the, there's a group to, be, to call out God's people from within the fallen churches. So there's a, God will use a group of people who will call out his people who remain in the fallen churches so that the plagues will not fall on them. While they remain in the churches, the, the, the angels are holding and check the stripes. The four winds of strife, because they are still in the fallen churches. That's that's the question I'm asking. That's the question. Or that statement I'm making. All right, thank you. That's Any other question? Okay, we'll just close with our, our drive-in court. These are Vigis 330. Remember this again. It is the love of self that brings unrest. When we are born from above, the same mind will be in us that was in Jesus. The mind that led him to humble himself that we might be saved. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Thank you. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our session as we continue and as we go deeper. Enable us to see the connection between the gospel, the true gospel, your character, and the seventh-day Sabbath rest, and the final warning, and the order of last-day events. Teach us, bless us, enable us to understand your word, rightly divide it, and bring us to the same mind in truth and righteousness. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.